Hotep, founder of the African History Network, host of the African History Network show. I'm a talk show host, researcher, lecture writer, and historian. So it is Thursday, February 11th, 2021, and we are live. Hope everybody's doing well. So I wanted to uh, come on and uh, do an overview of uh, the online course that I teach, the eight-week online course that I teach, uh, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school, okay? So a lot of people have been asking, what am I, what am I going to do for African American History Month? And uh, the last time I taught this, taught this class was in 2019, but uh, I'm teaching a eight-week, 16-hour online course that deals with thousands of years of history and deals with uh, what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. OK, so uh, it's going to be on Tuesdays, uh, Tuesdays, 8 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And uh, we we'll deal with thousands of years of history. Uh, I do a PowerPoint presentation. We have book references, about 50 articles that I reference. And uh, we're going to have some guest speakers as well. OK, so. Uh, join us uh, Tuesday, February 16th, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, I'm going to post the information here on the thread of the broadcast and also visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. You can uh, register there for the online course. And I'm going to do a brief overview. Uh, we'll go through a few slides here, do a brief overview of some of the comment. All right, so uh, Tuesday, February 16th, uh, our guest is going to be Sister Nubia Wartford, Sister Nubia Wartford, who is a cultural anthropologist. And uh, we're going to deal with the African queens of antiquity. And she does archaeological digs in the Sudan. So we're going to talk about um, uh, some of her research and, and things like this and, and some ancient African history. And this leads us up to uh, the transatlantic slave trade. All right. And we'll deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. We'll deal with uh, ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet, things like that. All right. So when we deal with the transatlantic slave trade, we have to understand that we can't start studying it in the 15th century. We can't start in 1441 when the Portuguese go into Mauritania. We can't start in 1619 in Virginia. We have to deal with the fact that uh, African people are the original people of North, Central and South America. And one of the books that I reference is um, The First Americans Were Africans, Documented Evidence by Dr. David M. Hotel. And many of you all have seen interviews I've done with him in the past or uh, heard interviews I've done with him in the past. Last time I interviewed him was October 12th, 2020, uh, when my um, radio show went to uh, the daily format. And uh, we're on Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight Eastern Standard Time on 9, 10 a.m. Superstation WFDF here in Detroit. And, but also we broadcast on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. And my YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotel, uh, Dr. David M. Hotel was my first guest. And October 12th was Columbus Day or Indigenous Peoples Day, as many people uh, call it now, Indigenous Peoples Day. So uh, that's just one of the uh, many books we reference in the course. OK, so I want to pull up the PowerPoint presentation here and we'll go over, do a brief overview of some of the things that we cover. And like I said, we deal with thousands of years of history. And we deal with what led up to uh, the transatlantic slave trade taking place also. And you have to deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors uh, as well, because the Moors are taking the teachings from ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt into Europe. And is bringing Europe out of the dark ages and um, they're teach taking the math and the science and astronomy, uh, agriculture, all different types of things like this. Uh, into Europe. Okay, so just one second here. Let's pull up the. Uh... All right, so let's pull up the slide. Okay, so. All right, and everybody share this broadcast on social media platforms. Invite your friends to tune in as well. So the, the name of the uh, class is uh, Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, where they didn't teach you in school. And it came, it, it, evolved out of a four hour lecture uh, that I did back in uh, June 2014. In the four hour lecture, it was, uh, I, was, I pulled together about seven years of research 
did this four hour lecture. Then this 16 hour, eight week online course evolved out of this four hour lecture also. Okay, just over the course of time, it evolved. So um, anytime I speak, I know I may say some things that are outside the circumference of some people's awareness. And uh, just because you never heard them before, disagree with them or don't like them does not mean that they are not true. It just means you have to do some research to understand uh, what I'm talking about. All right. And I learned that from uh, Dr. Ray Hagens. OK, so I'm going to skip over some of these. All right. Um, this is a good study from the Southern Poverty Law Center, teaching hard history, American slavery, teaching hard history, uh, American slavery. This is a 50, uh, I think about a 56 page study from the Southern Poverty Law Center. And uh, this study deals with how the history of slavery is being incorrectly taught in schools all across the country, how the history of slavery is being incorrectly taught in schools across the country. And it lays out uh, ways to better teach the history of slavery. And it did a survey of 1,000 high school seniors, okay? Um, and it found how little they know about the history of slavery. And it deals with the consequences of this type of history not being correctly taught in schools. There was, so this, so this, this study came out um, in uh, February, early February uh, or late January, 2018. Okay. And you can go to uh, the Southern Poverty Law Center website, splcenter.org, splcenter.org, and you can download the study. Teaching Hard History of American Slavery from the Southern Poverty Law Center. Okay, so there was an article. I first found out about this study. And this is one of the sources I use in the class for reference. And this is a good reference tool and a good teaching tool for parents to use right now who have their children at home because of, of coronavirus and their children are going to school online. And the other thing is, if your teacher, if your child's teacher uh, is not using this study at all, I was I would urge you to suggest this to them because one of the things they tell you don't do in here uh, when you deal with the history of slavery is, is don't do slave reenactments. Don't do slave reenactments. It tells you that because it can be very traumatizing to students and every, you know, African-American history month, every black history month, you hear stories about uh, slave history lessons gone wrong and mock and uh, mock slave auctions and reenactments of slavery, things like this. Don't do that. OK. All right. So um, when we look at when we look at this article here, this is from the Atlantic dot com. This is from February 1st, 2018. What kids are really learning about slavery? What kids are really learning about slavery? A new report finds that the topic of slavery is mistaught and often sentimentalized. And students are alarmingly misinformed as a result. Now, this this article and this study also tie into what's taking place in five states right now where they're trying to uh, the state legislatures. What they're trying to do is reduce how much teachers can teach about the uh, history of slavery and oppression okay this is taking place right now in uh states like uh arkansas and it's uh, arkansas iowa mississippi missouri and south dakota all right i'm gonna i'm gonna show you a couple articles that that's taking place right now there's one from uh usa today from february 10th 2021 february 10th 2021 republican state lawmakers want to punish schools that teach the 1619 Project, 1619 Project from the New York Times. So one of the reasons why this is so important is that when we go to government to get policies put in place that benefit us, to get our issues addressed that are the result of, uh, that are the result of bad policies, oftentimes we're dealing with people who are ignorant of history. Oftentimes we're dealing with people who are ignorant of history and ignorant of the history of African-Americans. And many of the policies that they support are detrimental to us. So, and this is one of the things that's talked about uh, in the study. This is why I've said before, America needs a massive history lesson. 
Okay, America needs a massive history lesson. So if we look at uh, the study here quickly, so a new report uh, released by the Southern Poverty Law Center's Teaching Tolerance Project points to the widespread failure to accurately uh, teach the hard and nuanced history of slavery, uh, the history of American slavery and enslaved people. Uh, collectively, the report finds that slavery is mistaught, mischaracterized, sanitized, and sentimentalized, leaving students poorly educated and contemporary issues of race and racism misunderstood. Contemporary issues of race and racism misunderstood. So what happens is, if this misunderstanding of history, race, and racism are not corrected, then they become adults who have children, adults who go off into their careers, they become doctors, attorneys, police officers, judges, politicians, president of the United States, what have you, okay? Ignorant of history. So let's continue. So in what is described as the first analysis of its kind, Teaching Tolerance conducted online surveys of 1,000 American high school seniors and more than 1,700 social studies teachers across the country. The group also reviewed 10 commonly used history textbooks, 10 commonly used history textbooks, and examined 15 sets of state standards to assess what students know, what educators teach, what publishers include in these textbooks and the teaching material, what publishers include, and what standards require what and what standards require vis-a-vis -vis slavery. So among 12th graders, among the 12th graders surveyed, there were 1,000 12th graders or high school seniors surveyed in this study. Among 12th graders, only 8% of 12th graders surveyed could identify slavery as the central cause of the Civil War. Only 8% of high school seniors surveyed could identify slavery as the central, central cause of the Civil War. Fewer than one-third or 32% of high school seniors surveyed correctly named the 13th Amendment as the formal end of U.S. slavery, with a slightly higher share, 35% choose in the Emancipation Proclamation of January 1st, 1863. And fewer than half or 46% identified the Middle Passage as the transport of enslaved Africans across the Atlantic Ocean to North America. So it's showing how little they know about the history of slavery and something that is probably a good probably true for the majority of them is they weren't taught this history by their parents. For the majority of them, they probably were not taught this history by their parents. And it's a good chance their parents don't know this history. All right. Now, if we compare this, if we look at what's going on, if we look at what's going on right now. We see um, there was an article, I talked about this on my show uh, in the last couple of weeks. There's an article here from news1.com. Republican proposed bills want to prevent teaching students about injustice. This is from February 5th, 2021, news1.com. Republican proposed bills want to prevent teaching students about injustice. Bills in several states want to limit teaching about racism and oppression, adopting the framing of the debunked 1776 commission report. Now, I posted this article uh, on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network. So if you follow us there, some of you may have seen it. It got over a thousand likes, actually got, got way more than a thousand likes, got hundreds of comments. And this is an example of what I'm talking about because what this shows is the disconnect between people's understanding of history and the policies they support, meaning that when the policies people support and who they support in office has a lot to do with their understanding of history.
and how we got to this point, the laws and policies put in place to bring about the conditions that we're dealing with today. OK, many people who are ignorant of history, for, for instance. We saw that Donald Trump vetoed when he was in office, he vetoed the National Defense Authorization uh, Bill, National Defense Authorization Act, about seven hundred forty one billion dollar bill. Part of the reason why he vetoed it was because it called for the renaming of military bases that were named after Confederate generals and Confederate soldiers. These were traitors to the Union. These were people who took up arms against the Union and committed treason against the Union based upon Article 3, Section 3 of the U.S. Constitution. They wanted to protect slavery. They wanted to protect their way of life. They took up arms against the Union. OK, incidentally, February 9th, 1861. I talked about this on my show a couple of nights ago, February 9th, 1861. Jefferson Davis of Mississippi was elected president of the Confederacy, the Confederate States of America. OK, the the, the traitors who seceded from the Union, they're going to uh, the Civil War, uh, February 9th, 1861, two months before the Civil War starts, starts April 12th, 1861, with the attack on Fort Sumter in South Carolina. So February 9th, 2021, 160 years later, uh, and, and Jefferson Davis wanted an insurrection. Because the Civil War hasn't started yet in February. You, you, you have a few states that have already seceded from the Union, starting with uh, South Carolina, December 20th, 1860. But uh, the Civil War hasn't started yet. Jefferson Davis wants an insurrection against the U.S. government. February 9th, 2021, you had another traitor who was put on trial in the U.S. Senate, an impeachment trial, for actually inciting an insurrection. His name was Donald John Trump. That's 160 years later. This is a little history tidbit there. So, but, but but Trump did not want to rename military bases named after Confederate quote unquote heroes. Okay. So what people, their level of understanding of history largely influences the types of policies and bills that they support and who they support in office. So if we go back and look, and look at this here, this is taking place right now. Uh, in states like uh, 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 Arkansas, Iowa, Mississippi, bills proposed in Arkansas, Iowa, and Mississippi prevent the use of the 1619 Project as part of teaching the legacy of slavery. The Arkansas legislature is considering two bills that would limit racial justice, uh, that would limit racial justice in the curriculum. House Bill 1231 will prevent schools from using the 1619 project as part of the curriculum. House Bill 1218 goes a step further by preventing lessons that promote the overthrow of the U.S. government. OK, that permit that that promote the overthrow of the U.S. government division between certain groups of people or social justice for certain groups, including race, gender, political affiliation and social class. Right. Read the rest of this article. This is this is taking place right now. And this deals with limit limiting what teachers can teach in the classroom about the history of racism and oppression. But this also ties into dealing with teaching about the history of slavery as well. OK, so then we look at um, there's a, another one here from. This is from uh, USA Today. And this is uh, about that same topic. This is from February 10th, 2021. February 10th, 2021. Republican state lawmakers want to punish schools that teach the 1619 Project. Now, there's some flaws in the 1619 Project, but it's much better than the 1776 Project. Luckily, uh, luckily, Joe Biden uh, disbanded the 1776 commission that Donald Trump put in place, and he took the 1776 project uh, off of White House.gov because that's where it was. So luckily, because the 1776 project, what it does is, is, is one of the things it does is distorts the history of slavery in this country. Republican state lawmakers want to punish schools that teach the 1619 project. 
Okay. And then uh, it talks about how lawmakers in several state houses uh, this year want to stop lessons, want to stop lesson plans that focus on the centrality of slavery to American history as presented in the New York Times 1619 project, pre, uh, uh, previewing new battles in states over control of civics education. Republican lawmakers in Arkansas, Iowa, Mississippi, Missouri, and South Dakota filed bills last month that if enacted would cut funding to K through 12 schools and colleges that provide lessons derived from the award-winning project the South Dakota bill has since been withdrawn. Okay, so read the rest of this. Uh, some historians say the bills are part of a larger effort by Republicans, Republicans, including former President Donald Trump, to glorify a more white and patriarchal view of American history that downplays the ugly legacy of slavery and the contributions of African Americans, Native Americans, women, and others to the nation's founding. All right. Read the rest of this article here. But so this is a debate taking place right now. This is a fight right now. And it's a fight over trying to control and downplay the legacy of slavery and the uh, and, and downplay racism and oppression in this country. But they're attacking the what's being taught in schools. OK, to facilitate this. It, once again, this is why the study from the Southern Poverty Law Center is so important. It's not perfect, but it, it's it's a lot better than what they're teaching. Teaching hard history of American slavery. Teaching hard history of American slavery. Okay, so if we go back to the slide. How's everybody doing? So I'm doing a uh, thanks thanks to those who are joining us. I'm doing a preview of a eight week, sixteen hour online course that I teach called Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Ma'afa, Understanding the Transatlantic Slave Trade, what they didn't teach you in school, okay? So you could join us in class uh, Tuesday, February 16th, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. It's eight consecutive uh, Tuesdays, uh, 8 p.m. to uh, 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. And we deal with thousands of years of history. We deal with uh, ancient Egypt, ancient Kemet. Uh, we deal with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. And we deal with what led up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. And we deal with the transatlantic slave trade also. All right. So uh, as soon as you register, we posted the link here. Uh, as soon as you register, there's bonus content. You can watch the courses regularly. Uh, it's regularly $130. It's on sale $80. We're kicking off. Here in African American History Month, a lot of people were asking because usually I travel and I do a lot of lectures during African American History Month, um, but not this year. Uh, so <laughs> a lot of things I'm doing are online. So we're doing this, uh, I'm teaching this uh, eight week online course. And last time I taught this course was 2019. OK, so there's been a lot of new information that's come out since then. And uh, we have a lot of that in the class. OK, uh, you can also visit our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. And uh, right on the home page, you can register uh, for the class. Actually, um, we'll show you the website right here. Uh, hold on. Let's see here. Just a second. Actually, we'll show you the website here. Uh, if you go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, and let's turn this on here. Right on the home page, if you just scroll down, you'll see information uh, about uh, my radio show. I'm on Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight, and Sundays. 9 p.m. 11 p.m. Also download the iHeartRadio app. You can listen to audio podcasts of our shows there. But we're on live here on Facebook and YouTube uh, for the show also. So we have information here for the online course. Um, and just click right here for register. And it takes you right here. And then just click right here for enroll. And then as soon as you enroll, you'll uh, be able to join us Tuesday uh, February 16th, and there's bonus content that you can watch also uh, because you'll be able to watch um, the class from uh, this past Tuesday, February 9th, 
and then you'll be able to join us uh, each week. All the shows are, uh, we do the class live, um, and then all the shows are recorded. You can go back and watch them over and over again. You can watch them on demand. So you, we do the class live. You can uh, chat in class. You can ask questions in class with the live chat. And uh, you can watch from around the world. All the shows are archived. You can go back and watch over and over again. Some people can't attend, you know, during the class time. They're at work, what have you. Watch whenever you want to. That's fine. I'm not going to take attendance. I'm not going to call your mother if you don't show up to class. Okay. So you don't have to worry about that. All right. So let's continue here. Um, I want to go back to the, uh, go back to the PowerPoint. Okay. Shaunika uh, said, I can't wait for a uh, class Tuesday. So our guest in class uh, Tuesday, February 16th is going to be a cultural anthropologist, uh, Sister Nubia Watford. I've already talked to Sister Nubia Watford. She's agreed to speak to the class. She does archeological digs in the Sudan, okay? Um, and we know there are twice as many pyramids in the Sudan as there are in Egypt. The lower portion of Egypt and the upper portion of the, of the Sudan in ancient times, that was Nubia or ta -Nehisi, okay? So we're gonna deal with, uh, one of the things we'll talk about are the African queens of antiquity. And we'll talk about some of our archaeological deals because we deal with a lot of archaeological discoveries in the class. And we deal with um, understanding how these different archaeological discoveries are causing scientists and anthropologists to have to push the timelines back. OK, I'm going to talk about that here in just a minute. But this is just an overview uh, of the class. And uh, these are some of the slides I actually use in the class as well because we do a PowerPoint presentation. OK, so um, read this article here from theatlantic.com. What are kids really learning about slavery? What are kids really learning about slavery? OK, so um, I'm going to skip past some of this here. Uh, OK, so some of the things we deal with in the class, what are the, what was the transatlantic slave trade? What were some of the events leading up to the transatlantic slave trade starting? You have to look at things chronologically. OK. Uh, historical events don't happen in the back, and they are the uh, culmination of a sequence of smaller events that take place that lead up to a larger event happening. One of my teachers, Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamene, who you see in uh, the Hidden Colors documentaries, and we're in a couple documentaries together also in the uh, Black Friday series, and then we're also in the uh, Black Friday series from um, Director Rick Mathis, Director Rick Mathis. So shout out to Rick and we're also in uh, Elementary Genocide Part 3 from Director Raheem Shabazz. Uh, Professor Jane Small and Professor Kaba Hiawatha Kamen, they were um, in that, um, in Part 3. Uh, one of the things Professor Kaba says is to understand the existence of something, you must first understand the pre-existence, the pre-existence of existence. To understand the existence of something, you must first understand the pre-existence of existence, okay? So this is why we deal with things chronologically and we go back into ancient Africa to deal with this. All right, so uh, what were some of the events that led up to the transatlantic slave trade starting? What role did Christopher Columbus play? Columbus is central to the transatlantic slave trade. He did not create it, but he's central to the spread of it. Uh, Columbus and his four voyages, and he never came to the land that we call the United States of America. So people need to stop this. You know, some people need to stop this. Columbus discovered America. Uh, when he goes on his four voyages, and I'll show you where he went in a few minutes, he never came to the land that we call the United States of America. The closest he came here was Cuba, which is about 90 miles away. All right. But he lays the foundation. He, help, he helps to lay the foundation for slavery, racism, capitalism, the exploitation of indigenous people. And uh, so Columbus is a, is a central figure that we have to study, as well as um, Right Reverend Bishop Bartolomeu de las Casas, because de las Casas went on some of uh, uh, the voyages that Columbus went on. And de las Casas kept a diary. Those diaries were turned into two books. Uh, uh, Tears of the Indians was one of them. I read both books back in college from Bartolomeu de las Casas. But de las Casas, in about 1517, uh, goes to uh, the king of Spain and, and it basically tells him that the um, the indigenous people, or what we would call Native Americans, they have suffered enough uh, because of the atrocities inflicted upon them by the Spanish and enslavement and killing them, things like this, and them being killed by disease, and that they should uh, exclusively enslave African people. 
it was about 1517 and about 1518 uh yeah the king of spain is, uh, signs the asiento which uh gives licenses to uh these other european nations to uh trade to import africans into spanish territories so they can be enslaved okay the asiento we'll talk about the asiento in class the asiento de negros that's that's extremely important because the port not to make this long okay but <laughs> this is a preview <laughs> i'm about to teach a class um the portuguese were the first ones involved in the transatlantic slave trade of 1441 basically right about 1441 but the portuguese are going, the spanish are going to be right behind the portuguese okay and different european nations get involved in the transatlantic slave trade at different times okay a lot of times you know we think that they just all jumped in all at the same time no that's not what happened but you have to understand the history of the moors and the moors being in europe in all this in these conflicts between these african moors and europeans this is this is going to lead up to the transatlantic slave trade happening and really didn't when you study it i mean europeans are getting revenge on the africans in the transatlantic slave trade the, the, the one of the mistakes that we make is a lot of people think that in the in the mid 15th century when the when the when this transatlantic slave trade starts a lot of people mistakenly think this was the first time that europeans came in contact with african people no <laughs> africans they were already in europe for hundreds of years hundreds of years i'm just i'm just talking about the from 711 ad to 1492 just that period of time yes they were in there even before then but just that period of time for 711 to 1492 was a crucial crucial period of time um Two of the books, two of the books that I use in the class for reference. Now, you don't have to buy any of these books. You can if you want to. You don't have to feel obligated to buy any of these books, but just for reference, okay? Golden Age of the Moor, edited by Dr. Ivan Van Sertima, Golden Age of the Moor, and Renoko Rashidi has an essay in here, Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay, um, Dr. Uh, Dr. Wayne Chandler, Jan Carew, Dr. John G. Jackson. They all have essays in here. Golden Age of the Moor. This is probably one of the best books dealing with the history of the moors in europe and what's basically known as medieval time and then this in here from renoko rashidi um black star the african presence in early europe black star the african presence in early europe this is a, a fantastic fantastic book from uh renoko rashidi okay so those are just two books that i use as reference all right um you don't have to if you don't buy any of the books, you'll still be able to follow along in class and learn in class. All right. Um, let me post them. How's everybody doing? Okay, we got John Ray, Shao Nika, uh, just a few of the people watching. All right. And we'll post the information here. You can uh, register for the online course. So it means Tuesdays, 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Uh, and uh, you know, some a lot of times I go over, a little bit over. I'm gonna try to stick within the two hours, but sometimes. You know, we may do two hours, 20 minutes, what have you. And uh, we do a thousand years of history. We're going to have some guest speakers also in the class. All the sessions are recorded. You can go back and watch it over and over again. It's interactive. It's visual. Uh, we have video clips, book references, about 50 articles that I cite. We have a PowerPoint presentation. So you're going to learn a lot. Okay. Uh, we also deal with when did the first Africans come to the U.S. as slaves? When did the first Africans come to the U.S. as slaves? We'll deal with that history because it's also important to understand that in 1619, you know, uh, uh, 2019 was the 400th year anniversary of, of Virginia and those 20 and odd Africans or 20 and odd Negroes uh, on the white line slave ship being traded or the white line pirate ship, I should say, the white line pirate ship uh, being traded for uh, water and food and supplies. Right. But in 1619. Codified slave laws did not exist in any of the 13 colonies. Codified slave laws did not exist in any of the 13 colonies. This is another book that I use for reference before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett Jr. Because when you read chapter two of Before the Mayflower, and, man, and I, I got to <laughs> caution myself, I need to keep this short, okay? Because <laughs> I would do three hours right now. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I, I have to do my radio show today too. When you read chapter two of, Be of Before the Mayflower, Lerone Bennett Jr. talks about, um, you know, how 
in 1619, basically, uh, they didn't have codified slave laws. And, but also in the back of the book, uh, he has a, uh, landmarks and milestones, filling with history, landmarks and milestones. Okay. This is the sixth edition of before the Mayflower by Lerone Bennett Jr. You see, I've had my copy for, <laughs> for years. Okay. It's a beat up copy, but if you go and look at, um, it's like about a hundred pages of landmarks and milestones. So it breaks it down basically like each year and landmarks in African-American history. If you go look at uh, December 1641, December 1641, Massachusetts becomes the first colony to give statutory recognition to slavery. That's 1641. Other colonies followed. Connecticut in 1650, Virginia in 1661, Maryland in 1663. Uh, New York and New Jersey, 1664, South Carolina, 1682, Rhode Island and Pennsylvania, 1700, North Carolina, 1715, Georgia, 1750. The, the whole way that slavery really evolves in the 13 British colonies, I'm not talking about the Spanish colonies. I'm not talking about Portuguese or anything like that. I'm, talk I'm not talking about the Dutch because the Dutch were in this land. This is where you get uh, where, where you have New York. And like the state of New York and, the, and New York was a colony before it was the colony of New York. It was the colony of New Amsterdam. And that was a Dutch colony. OK, you're going to have the French here as well. Uh, we know Detroit was founded by the French. But. When you look at the, the 13 colonies, the 13 British colonies, the way slavery evolves in those 13 colonies historically is different than the way most people think it evolves. All the slavery didn't exist in all the colonies all at one time. It didn't just poof. OK, we have slavery. No, it's going to evolve and hit different colonies. OK, um, so in those first 20 and not Africans, they're going to be put to a form of indentured servitude and released after about three to five years or so. In Virginia, at, at, at uh, Point Comfort in Virginia, and I, I show you this in the class, they have a historical marker there that tells some of this history and talks about them you know, being released after a certain number of years and put into like a form of indentured servitude, something, something to that effect. Okay, uh, let's continue here. So we deal with um, when did Africans first come to the U.S. as slaves? Did Africans sell themselves into slavery? We deal with that complicated history because that's largely misunderstood also. And uh, were African people in America before the slave trade? <laughs> Which is a very, very good question. Because when you read, uh, you study like, it, it, not just they came before Columbus, but the first Americans were Africans, came into evidence by Dr. David M. Hotel. We were here in this land going back at least 51,700 years. This, we were here before Native Americans came into existence. This is, this is actually our land stolen from us. This does not mean the transatlantic slave trade did not happen. Okay, some people jump off the deep end and say, well, because African people were already here, the Khoisan were here, there was a, a presence of ancient Kemet because we were already here. That means the transatlantic slave trade did not happen. No. D different thing, all, all these things take place. And African people um, migrate and travel at different periods of time for different reasons. Sometimes it's forced migration. Sometimes they're captured. Sometimes they have to leave because of uh, weather conditions or uh, vegetation dries up or what have you. Sometimes they leave because they are exploring. It, it depends. So you have to understand like a chronology of history of like the last 50,000 years of history, 60,000 years of history, as opposed to just the last 500 years of history. If you just look at the last 500 years of history, then you just think, oh, OK, we came here because we were captured. OK, and conquered and shackled and changed by Europeans. You look at the, 50, the last 50,000 years of history. You look at we were here in this land before there was anybody else here. Before there was anybody who we call Native Americans. Because the Native Americans are the offspring of an intermixing of Africans who were already here and Asians who come to this land around 3000 B.C. And um, they intermix. And their offspring or who we call Native Americans. But the other thing is, and Dr. David M. M. Hotep talks about this in his book, and there's others that deal with this also. The other thing is, there are groups of Africans here when European settlers come here. You talk about in 1607, you talk about the British coming in like 1607. 
And a lot of those different groups of Africans get reclassified as Native Americans. So, so that's one of the ways our populations were absorbed. A lot of those groups of Africans get reclassified as Native Americans, but then you don't know it. You know, Dr. Jose Pimenta Bay talks about, um, I interviewed him back in 2010. He's one of my first interviews I did when I started the African History Network show. Um, and he has an essay in um, Golden Age of the Moor. And he used to, uh, he, he teaches classes on um, the history of Moors at, uh, I know he was doing it at, at Temple University. Then he went to Berea College in Kentucky. So um, I need to reach out to him. It's been a few years since I've talked to him. Um, but he teaches history, he teaches classes on the history of the Moors. And one of the things he talks about is if you don't know the names that your people have had throughout history, you won't know how to find yourself in history. If you don't know the names your people have had throughout history, you won't know how to find yourself in history. You, you hear about Carthaginians or Phoenicians and don't know those are African people. OK, um, you hear about Nubians and may not know those are African people or um, you hear about Ethiopians. OK, uh, because when uh, the Italians invaded Ethiopia in um, uh, and, and fought against uh, Menelik II. Um, about uh, you had the Battle of Attawa in uh, about 1896. The Ethiopians, these African people, beat the Italians so badly. The Italians lied to the world and said that the Ethiopians were white because they didn't want they, they didn't want the world to know that they were beaten by these African people. Okay. So if you don't know the names that you've had throughout history, you won't know how to find yourself in history. Where you talk about Moors, where you talk about, you know, some people still confuse and think Egypt is part of the Middle East or ancient Egyptians were white or something like that or brown skinned Caucasians. Right. <laughs> OK, so. All right, let's continue here. Uh, so we do with the 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors. Shocking archaeological uh, discoveries that are causing experts to rethink everything. We do with insurance companies that took out policies on slave ships and enslaved Africans on plantations like the uh, Nautilus, the Nautilus Life Insurance Company, uh, which then becomes the New York Life Insurance Company. OK, now, in all fairness, it was like for three years. Um, that they were uh, involved in, in um, they sold policies on slaves on the plantations, okay? They did this for like the first three years of their existence, okay? Now, they have been one that's um, admitted to what happened and provided records and things like this. There was a big article, I think, from the New York Times that, that talked about their involvement, but they, but they have been one that's been upfront about and they've talked about that history, the New York Life Insurance Company, when it was the uh, Nautilus Life Insurance Company, I think it was called in the beginning. It was like the first three years of their existence, like right around 1845. Um, we do with shocking archaeological discoveries that are causing experts to rethink everything. Uh, Freemasonry America and the Founding Fathers. Freemasonry America and the Founding Fathers. Origins of the term America and more. So it's, it's a lot that we do. This is just a brief, brief overview uh, of what we deal with in the class. Uh, let me see. Let me skip through some of this. I got to skip through some of this. Okay. So uh, this is Dr. David M. Hotel. He wrote the book, The First Americans Were African Documented Evidence. His book is backed up by seven peer reviewed articles and 713 footnotes. And um, his book came out in 2011. All right. Uh, I have to check with him because his new book should be out um, any month now. Last time I talked to him, he was working on the um, bibliography. He was trying to get the bibliography done. But his, on page 14 of his book, he lays out 14, 13, 13 different disciplines. And 
he deals with a discovery in, in Allendale County, South Carolina in 2004, uh, done by Dr. Albert Goodyear, Dr. Albert Goodyear. And this discovery, uh, they found 13 types of evidence to show an African presence in the territory we call South Carolina, going back at least 51,700 years. So they found artifacts, architecture, campsites, carvings, Egyptian writings, footprints in lava, genetic M174, dehaploid groups, uh, dealing with DNA and genetics, linguistics, skulls, skeleton structures, and tools, okay? They found 13 different types of diff uh, disciplines fairly documenting an African presence in uh, the land we call South Carolina, going back at least 51,700 years ago. This was th These were the Khoisan. The Khoisan have the oldest DNA on the planet. They're the ancestors that I knew in the Twa. They go all around the world. They come from Southern Africa, the Khoisan. Um, his book is also backed up by 713 footnotes as well, as well as seven peer-reviewed peer articles. Now, this is Dr. Albert Goodyear. Here's a picture of him. He happens to be a... a, a uh, white archaeologist. Uh, he's a professor at the University of South Carolina. This is an article from 2004 from ScienceDaily.com. ScienceDaily.com. Okay. And uh, ScienceDaily.com is a scientific uh, website. They have scientific discoveries, archaeological discoveries, things like this. So this is an article from 2004. The article is still there. It's called New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. New Evidence Puts Man in North America 50,000 Years Ago. And it talks about Dr. Albert Goodyear's discovery. Okay. Uh, here is a summary of the article. It says radiocarbon tests of carbonized plant remains were artifacts were unearthed last May along the Savannah River in Allendale County by University of South Carolina archaeologist Dr. Albert Goodyear indicate that the sediments containing these artifacts are at least 50,000 years old, meaning that humans inhabited North America long before the last ice age. OK, now this is before Native Americans even come into existence. This is before Native Americans even come into existence. Um, so this these were the Khoisan. So you can check this out. You don't have to take my word for it. Proper doc, proper documentation in all conversation. You don't believe a word that I say. This is something that you hear me say in my presentations and uh, uh, Facebook broadcasts on my radio show in, in the class. Also, you know, I'll provide you with the with the research. I'll provide you with the evidence. You can go research this yourself. You don't believe a, you don't have to believe a word that I say. Okay, um, this is a. This was a monumental discovery. This is from 2010, February 2010. This is from New York Times. All these archaeological discoveries, uh, a lot of them you, you'll read about National Geographic, New York Times, Washington Post, NBC News, the NBC News dot com. You'll have the, they'll have them on the website. Now, on MSNBC, you won't see a lot of these discoveries, but on um, in different news outlets, the, their, their websites. You'll read about these discoveries, okay? And these discoveries are taking place basically every month, if if not more frequent. This deals with, uh, this is from February 2010. On Crete, new evidence of very ancient mariners. On Crete, new evidence of very ancient mariners, okay? So here's an excerpt of what this article said. This, uh, this is an excerpt of this discovery, okay, from the article. Stone tools found on the Greek island of Crete over two summers, over the course of two summers, they did excavations on the Greek island of Crete. And archaeologists say that these stone tools are at least 130,000 years old. Archaeologists say these stone tools are at least 130,000 years old, which is considered strong evidence for the earliest known seafaring in the Mediterranean and calls for rethinking the maritime capabilities of pre-human cultures. 
So, you know, Renoka Rashidi, Dr. Charles Finch, other African Senate scholars have been saying for years that at least 130,000 years of our history is missing. When these archaeological discoveries like this take place, and we talk about a lot, of, we talk about a lot of them in the class. When these archaeological discoveries take place, the scientists, the paleontologists, the archaeologists, etc., they say we have to rethink everything, and they have to push the timelines back. They have to push the timelines back. They they start talking about how. All of these things are much older than we think. Remember, Juvenile had the song like back in 1999, back that thing up. They keep having to back that thing up. They keep having to back the timelines up. When you read uh, when you read these articles about these studies, it says Crete has been an island for more than five million years, meaning that the tool makers must have arrived by boat. So this seems to push the history of Mediterranean voyaging back more than 100,000 years. They have to back that thing up. They have to back the timelines up. They say, wait a second, hold on. Humans were sailing 100,000 years before we thought they were sailing. Specialists in Stone Age archaeology say, uh, so, so, so uh, Mediterranean voyaging uh, back more than 100,000 years, specialists in Stone Age archaeologists say, previous artifact discoveries has shown people reaching Cyprus and a few other Greek islands and possibly Sardinia no earlier than 10,000 to 12,000 years ago. So they so they have to push the timelines back. They're saying, wait a second, they were humans, it appears, were sailing 100,000 years prior to what we thought. This article is 11 years old. This discovery is 11 years old. There's been a lot more that they've discovered since then. Because this article from the New York Times, the science section, February 15, 2010. Okay. All right. So you can check it out. Um, that's just a sample of some of the archaeological discoveries we did with. Because what we're going through, we, we build a, a foundation, a historical foundation to better understand what's coming in the class and better understand history and these archaeological discoveries and deal with a chronology of history. That's extremely important, a, a, a chronology of history and understand cause and effect. Okay, so um, very quickly here, let me see. It was uh, just a couple other things I want to show you. Let's look at, um, uh, we look at, okay, so we talk about, um, 800 year occupation of Europe by the Africans known as the Moors and the Moors losing control uh, of the last stronghold, Granada in Spain, January 2nd, 1492. We'll deal with that. Then this ties into uh, Freemasonry. This ties into symbolism and ties right back into the Nile Valley region of Africa, ancient Kemet. Uh, one of the uh, books that we use is um, Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder and Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. Okay, this is a book. Um, when I was doing my lectures dealing with the uh, history of St. Patrick's Day, I had to study Irish history to get a better understanding of St. Patrick's Day. So this is one of the books that I read, uh, the Everything Irish History and Heritage book, because I've done lectures dealing with the history of all the um, uh, European holidays we've been taught to celebrate Christmas and Easter, St. Patrick's Day, things like this. So that that's dealing with Irish history. That's not the book I'm looking for. Uh, the book I'm looking for is Nile Valley Contributions right here. Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. This is another book we use in the class, Christianity Before Christ by Dr. John G. Jackson. That's another source. Um, but this is what I was looking for. Nile Valley Contributions to Civilization. And Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. Once again, you don't have to buy any of these books. If you have them, some people may have these books on their shelves. I'm going to show you some stuff in here. Now about the contributions to civilization is going to blow your mind. All right. So uh, if we look at the Washington Monument, see the Washington Monument is an ancient African symbol known as a Tekken. The Greeks called it an obelisk. And it's a symbol of resurrection coming from the story of Osar, Oset, and Heru, the Greeks called them Osiris, Isis, and Horus. And 
in ancient Kem and ancient Egypt, as we see uh, on the left, uh, my left, um, you'll see it there. There were 1,200 Tekkenu, Tekkenu for plural, in ancient Kemet or ancient Egypt. All right. Let's uh, let's look at this here. So if we look at Freemasonry, because the Moors are taking the teachings from ancient Kemet, from ancient Egypt, from the Nile Valley region of Africa. They're taking these teachings into Europe when they go in the 711 AD. They're teaching this to Europeans. This is where you're going to get the Knights Templar formed during the Second Crusades, 1118 AD. We'll, do, we'll take you through our history, deal with, deal with all this, okay? Um, and then the Knights Templars are disbanded. You have a group rounded up in France, uh, October 13th, 13, about 1310 or 1307. And uh, the teachers are going to go underground, resurface as the uh, Yorkshire Rites of the Freemason, the Rosicrucians these different secret societies or societies with secrets as, as Tony Browder calls them. And then Freemasons are coming to this land that's going to be called the United States of America. So you have uh, those teachings coming here as well. And you say like George Washington, okay? Um, 50 other 56 signers of the Declaration of Independence were Freemasons. So if we look at this right here, this is from page 18 and 32 of Egypt on the Potomac by Tony Browder. The word Mason is derived from the Latin words mass and sun. The word Mason is derived from the Latin, Latin words mass and sun. Mason means child of light and expresses the desire to pursue light, which is a metaphor for the sun, which symbolizes knowledge, okay? All of this is connected. All of this is connected coming out of the Nile Valley region of Africa and Africans travel into Central Africa, they travel into West Africa, they circumnavigate the globe, they take these teachings with them. People come into Africa and, and learn these teachings. All of this stuff is connected. So the term child of light or sons and daughters of light was first used to identify students who had completed 42 years of study in the temples of ancient Kemet. Many Masonic temples were modeled after the temples of Kemet, places where light or knowledge was imparted in a series of steps or degrees. So when you go to a higher, when you go to a liberal arts college in the several, in the liberal arts, we're going to see that originate in ancient Kemet. Um, when you go to a liberal arts college, you go to college in general and you get your credentials in a series of degrees, associate degree, bachelor's degree, master's degree, PhD, what have you, this is where that's coming from. You're getting your credentials in a series of degrees. And in ancient times, light was synonymous with knowledge. In ancient times, light was synonymous with knowledge. So the term child of light or sons and daughters of light was first used to identify students who had completed 42 years of study in the in the lodges, okay, the temples of ancient Kemet. Um, many Masonic temples were modeled after the temples, places where light knowledge was imparted in a series of steps or degrees. So even today, if you have a child in class and the child is smart, you may say that's a bright child, bright associated with light, associated with knowledge. That's a bright child. If you watch a, a cartoon and it, it may be Doc Stuffins or any of these other cartoons, uh, uh, my daughter likes uh, Paw Patrol, right? <laughs> Paw Patrol, I ain't know nothing about Paw Patrol because she started singing the song, okay? <laughs> so <laughs> I never heard of Paw Patrol, but it may be Paw Patrol or it may be older cartoons, uh, uh, Tom and Jerry, things like this, right? And then the cartoon character gets an idea and the light bulb goes off over the cartoon character's head, okay? That's symbolizing light, symbolizing knowledge. That's ancient. But then also, darkness is associated with ignorance. So if you have a child who is not too bright, right? <laughs> You may say that's a dim child, D-I-M, or dim with it. That's a dim child, absence of light, 
okay? Darkness associated with ignorance. When you look at Europe going into the dark ages, it's a, a period of hundreds of years of ignorance. And it's going to be, it's going to be the Africans, these Moors, who go into Europe in 8th century AD, take the light of ancient Kemet, take the knowledge of ancient Kemet and the Nile Valley region of Africa into Europe to bring Europe out of the dark ages. And then the next age, the next age is the Renaissance age, which is a, a new late age of enlightenment. Enlightenment, light, L-I-G-H-T, associated with knowledge, awakening. Okay, so all of this is all of this is connected. All right, so very quickly here, how's everybody doing? Okay, uh, so once again, the class meets on Tuesdays, eight p.m. to uh, ten p.m. Eastern Standard Time. Ancient Kemet, the Moors, and the Maafa understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach you in school. Uh, we deal with this type of information and um, a chronology of what leads up to the transatlantic slave trade taking place. You can register for the class at our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, right on the home page. You'll see the information. Click on register here. Um, it's on sale, $80, regularly $130. We do the classes live on Tuesdays. All the sessions are recorded. Uh, so you can go back and watch it over and over again. You can watch from around the world. You don't have to be present in class. You can ask questions in class. We have a live chat. So it's, it's visual. We have the PowerPoint presentation, video clips, book references. There's about 50 articles that I reference, and we're going to have some um, special uh, speakers as well. So uh, uh, Tuesday, February 16th, 8 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, uh, 2021. Uh, our guest speaker will be Sister Nubia Wartford who's a uh, cultural anthropologist and she, um, she, she's going to deal with the African Queens of antiquity. And she'll talk about some of the uh, archeological uh, digs she's done in the Sudan. Okay. And there's more archeological evidence of uh, ancient Africa and, you know, things like this in the Sudan than there is in Egypt. There are twice as many pyramids in the Sudan as there are in Egypt. Okay. So uh, visit AfricanHistoryNetwork.com. Uh, the registering we just posted the link here and as soon as you register there's bonus content that you can watch uh also and um you can watch uh the class we did this past tuesday february 9th as well all right so this meets eight consecutive uh tuesdays okay all right so freemasonry uh did you know that 50 of the 56 signers of the declaration of independence and 13 of the 39 signers of the u.s constitution were freemasons did you know that four of the five first U.S. presidents were Freemasons and there have been 14 Freemasons who have uh, been U.S. presidents? OK, uh, read page 18 of Egypt on the Potomac. And then also you deal with Benjamin Banneker, who did the surveying uh, for the layout of Washington, D.C. He's talked about it here as well. And one of the things that Egypt on the Potomac uh, deals with and Browder does a tour uh, if you ever get to go on Browder's tour, and I haven't seen it, but I've talked to him about it, I've interviewed him about it. Um, his book deals with how the layout of Washington, D.C. is basically a copy of the layout of ancient Egypt. OK, and he takes you on his physical tour. He takes you on his tour around uh, Washington, D.C. and shows you the symbols and things like this and how that all connects back to ancient Kemet, ancient Egypt. All right, it's, 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 it's fascinating. He was interviewed um, back in, I think it was 2016 or 2015. He was interviewed on News One Now. Um, uh, what was, um, there was an attorney sitting in for Roland Martin, uh, Mo, uh, I, forgot, I forgot her name, but she was sitting in for Roland and um, she, uh, interview Tony Browder. Okay. Um, I want to say Mo Kelly, but I don't think it wasn't Mo Kelly. It was, um, I forgot who it was, but it's, it's at, uh, news1.com's, uh, website. Let me see. Discover ancient Africa's influence on America. Discover ancient Africa's influence on America. And, um, Mo Ivory, that's who it is. Mo Ivory, I could see her face, and I couldn't, I couldn't think of uh, her last name. Okay, Mo Ivory, Attorney Mo Ivory, interviewed Tony Browder. Tony Browder 
I mean, Broward is brilliant. We've been on a panel discussion before uh, down in Atlanta. And um, uh, check out that interview at uh, newsone.com, okay? Uh, ancient uh, discover ancient Africa's discover ancient Africa's influence on American federal symbols. All right, check that out at newsone.com. And let me see here. Since we have the screen share, I can show it to you. All right, how's everybody doing today? How you all like this type of information? Okay, this right here. Check this out. This will blow you away. This is from February 13th, 20, uh, February 13th, 2015, news1.com. They interviewed Tony Browder about Egypt on the Potomac. All right. All right, so check that out. All right, let's continue here. We'll be here for a few more minutes. Okay, so then we uh, we deal with things like Osar, Osset, and Heru, who the Greeks call Osiris, Isis, and Horus, and the uh, first holy trinity. This may go outside the circumference of some people's awareness. Okay, uh, the first holy trinity, and, uh, you know, Heru born on December 25th of a virgin birth to the virgin Osset, who the Greeks called Isis. So we deal with all of that. Uh, lastly, let me jump to uh, Christopher Columbus here very quickly. So we deal with we have to deal with uh, Columbus and where Columbus went on his four voyages. OK, that's extremely important to understand this. And more and more cities and states are celebrating indigenous people's day which is good okay which is very good but when you look at where columbus went on his four voyages he never came to the land that we call the united states of america if you go to history.com which is the official website of the history channel and uh, just search for Christopher Columbus. They have a lot of information there to show you where he went on his four voyages. But uh, he set sail August 3rd, 1492 on the Nina, the Penta, the Santa Maria. And he uh, lands in uh, the Bahamas or what he calls San Salvador on October 12th, 1492. Uh, he goes into Hispaniola. He goes into Cuba, uh, Puerto Rico, things like this, uh, Jamaica, West Indies, Trinidad. Uh, South America, Panama, Honduras. He never comes to the land that we call the United States of America. If you go to history.com and do some research on Christopher Columbus, it starts giving you a, a, a better foundation to really understand this and starts dispelling myths. Okay. Um, in 70%, uh, Dr. David M. Hotep in uh, The First Americans Were Africans, he talks about how 70% of the people Columbus encounters in the islands he travels to, 70% uh, of the people were African people because we were already in a lot of those areas as well. And then we talk about Bartolome de las Casas. Bartolome de las, right, right Reverend Bishop Bartolome de las Casas estimates that Columbus was responsible for the murder of 12, 12 million and 25 million indigenous people. Uh, another good book to read is by uh, Dr. John Henrik Clark, uh, Christopher Columbus in the African Holocaust, Slavery and the Rise of European Capitalism which I have around here somewhere. It's in one of these stacks of books that I have um, around here as well. Okay, so uh, let me see here. And then we deal with, uh, you know, we talk about uh, uh, West Africa as well, and we deal with um, the three great West, uh, three great West African um uh, kingdoms, Ghana, Shanghai, and Mali. So we, we'll talk about that history also uh, and try to, you know, do a chronology of history. Ghana, originally called Wagadu, uh, Mali, Shanghai. Uh, Classical Africa by Dr. Malefis Kete Asante is a really good book. It's written for uh, middle school children and um, for their teachers. But it's a, it's a really good uh, book that breaks down maybe what may be some complicated 
concepts, things like this. It really breaks it down. So it's it's a really good book. Um, so we talk about uh, those three uh, kingdoms as well. And some of this I also tie into the film Black Panther. Uh, I've done a lot of research on the film Black Panther. We deal with the fake Willie Lynch letter 1712 because Willie Lynch never historically existed also. This is Professor Manu and Pim, brilliant historian. I just interviewed him. Uh, I interviewed him in 2020 also. But uh, uh, we dealt with in 2020, we dealt with uh, the passing of Representative John Lewis and, and some civil rights history and uh, Kwame Ture, Stokely Carmichael, the Black Power Movement and Kwame Ture, Kwame Ture winning the chairmanship in 1966, a SNCC and uh, John Lewis and others leaving SNCC, a SNCC goes um, uh, in another direction, goes in the black power direction. All right. So these are just some of the things that we deal with uh, in the online course. All right. So was ancient Kemet, the Moors and the Ma'afa understanding the transatlantic slave trade, what they didn't teach in school. And it's at our website. Um, you can register at our website, africanhistorynetwork.com, africanhistorynetwork.com right on the home page how's everybody doing uh it meets tuesdays tuesdays 8 p.m to 10 p.m eastern standard time okay and it's right on the uh when you go to our website africanhistorynetwork.com uh, it's right on the home page we'll post the link here again uh so you can register for it as soon as you register you can start watching bonus content and there's more bonus content uh, that I'm adding also. Uh, let's see here. There's more bonus content that I'm adding as well. Let's turn on the screen share. So this is something good for African American History Month. Now, a lot of people want to know, can my uh, child use this, and my son or daughter? Is it uh, child friendly? I would say it's PG-13. I don't do a lot of cursing and things like that. I'm not trying to be vulgar, but there are some, you know, maybe some unpleasant topics that we have to talk about. But I would say it's PG-13. OK, that's how that's how I would put it. So if you go to our website, AfricanHistoryNetwork.com, scroll down, you'll see the information for uh, uh, a radio show. You can read articles that I write here also. I think it may have. 50, 60 articles I've written. And then it has information here about the eight-week course. Click right here for register here. It takes you right here, 16-hour uh, online course. And then just click right here for enroll. And as soon as you enroll, you can start watching content, okay? And you'll be ready for Tuesday. Uh, we have bonus content there. But you'll be ready for our Tuesday class of February 16th, okay? All right, so we'll post a link here. Uh, be sure to listen to the African History Network show Sunday. Uh, well, for four years, we were on only Sunday. As of October 12, 2020, we're on six days a week. Okay, so <laughs> be sure to listen to our show Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight Eastern Standard Time. Monday through Friday, 11 p.m. to 12 midnight Eastern Standard Time, the African History Network show. And then uh, also Sundays, 9 p.m. to 11 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, we broadcast here on our Facebook fan page, the African History Network, and on our YouTube channel, Michael M. Hotep, I-M-H-O-T-E-P. And I'm on um, also on 9, 10 a.m., the Superstation WFDF I do uh, in Detroit. I do radio here in Detroit also, okay? All right, so be sure to um, be sure to check that out. And we'll see you all in class. Uh, if you have any questions, you can email me ahn show at africanhistorynetwork.com ahn show at africanhistorynetwork.com okay um if you have any questions ahn show at africanhistorynetwork.com also if you want to um pay through cash app because when you go to our website you can pay through paypal or a debit card credit card but if you want to pay through cash app uh email us also okay um and if you, once again, uh, if you can't make it Tuesdays, you can't make it Tuesdays, the shows are archived. We, we do the show live, we do the class live, and we record the class, so it's archived there, okay, at the 
at our online platform or at our online school is archived. So you can go back and watch it whenever you want to over and over again. So if you can't watch it to Thursday or Friday or Saturday or the weekend, you can go back and watch it. That's fine. You don't have to be in class live to watch the class or participate, you know, get the information. All right. Okay, look, hey, we got to get out of here. Remember, at the African History Network, we focus, we focus on educating, empowering, and inspiring people of African descent throughout the diaspora and around the world because right now it's correct wrong behavior. Hope you're learning a lot for the month of February, African American History Month, Black History Month. Remember, right now it's correct wrong behavior. It's not over till we win. We're kind of forever. And we'll talk to you next time. Peace.